was so hot. We just pulled a blow up bed outside. We're just sleeping with a sheet. We woke up and saw the skies illuminating. I've never seen anything like that. We couldn't sleep, so we drove down to the cliff. We just sat in the car for like 30 or 40 minutes just watching the storm show itself over the ocean. To see those lightnings like a web across the ocean was beautiful. The lightning was out on the horizon. Then this huge burst of wind just kind of pushed us back. It just felt like it was actually hitting. We felt it in the car, we felt it on our face. It kind of went from beautiful to eerie. Then we were like, okay, we need to go home. I sat straight up in bed. This massive gust of wind came into the bedroom. It was so strong that it blew the shades to a horizontal position. And it was just this incredible display for the rest of the night. Oh, let's start with the lightning, okay. I woke up Sunday morning, I was gasping for air, and what the hell is this, you know? And the electricity was out because my CPAP machine w wasn't working. And I went into the living room, and one wall of my house is just nothing but glass. And it was just surreal, what I saw. My name is Steve Pizzo. I've lived up on Bonnie Dune for over 50 years. I'm a retired firefighter. Come Monday, I started smelling the smoke. Went down to Felton, and I ran into a friend of mine who was on Cal Fire. And I said, hey, John, I go, so uh, what are you guys doing with the Warren Elk Fire? He looked at me, and he just shook his head, and he goes, it's bad. We're stretched thin right now. We've got over 300 lightning fires around the state. Pray that the winds don't kick up. Tuesday, August 18th, it got worse around here. They were keeping it at bay with helicopter drops. That's all they could do. You couldn't get hand crews in or nothing. We were home that night and I had cooked dinner. Seven o'clock or eight o'clock that night, I heard that they were evacuating Boulder Creek. I go, so if they're evacuating Boulder Creek, this fire's already made an end run around Ben Lomond Mountain. I got a bad feeling about this. Over the years of being a fireman, I was on the Lexington fire in the 80s. I was on the Oakland Hills fire in the 90s. But nothing like this. I never had this feeling. So I said, you know, I'm going to go to Eagle Rock. That's where we used to have an old smoke lookout in the 70s and the 80s. So I drive up there. It's dark. It's hot. It's windy. I get about 100 feet from the top, and I get out, and it's at least 20 degrees hotter than it was in Bonnie and my eyes were burning and I couldn't catch my breath. And the wind's blowing real weird. You know, the wind's blowing uh, south to north. And occasionally I, I would get these cold gusts of wind that would make me shiver. And I'd go, wow, this is really weird. The whole sky just like lit up. It's like when you're sitting in a the theater right before the movie, you know how the blank screen is? Like that. And then my little guardian angel that's been sitting on my shoulder for 25 years when I was a fireman told me, Steve, it's time to go. So you guys said, bring in stuff. Well, this is the stuff that started falling from the sky, carbonized leaves. And some of it was coming down in embers. In these type of fires, they create their own weather system. This fire, if I could have stripped away the smoke, I would have seen a tornado. That place hasn't been burned, really burned, since the 50s. The ground cover was anywhere from four to five feet thick. We've been in a 10-year prolonged drought, so there's no humidity in the fuel load. All the factors that go along with a wildfire were all lined up in a straight line. All it needed was the lightning, and away it went. That day of work before we evacuated, it was very, very hot. We had had, I think, six days in a row over 100 degrees. 
My name is Erin Martin. and um, I'm Noelle Martin. I'm a senior in high school. Yeah, and we are from Boulder Creek. That day was very ashy. There was a lot of ash falling from the sky, and the road was blocked off Jameson Creek, and there were cars just bumper to bumper heading out. And we have a lot of animals, and so we asked them if we could please just get our animals, and they led us through to do that. We all worked together. The, t the kids did so well. We kind of split up and three goats and six chickens, which went in the minivan with my husband. And we have two dogs, which went with my son and I, and then Noelle took two cats and a rabbit in her car. So we were, you know, panicked. Yeah, it's a lot going on. It's, it's hard to balance it all. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> and I put it over here is a piece of my son's yearbook. There's not much left of it, so I'm not really sure what, what year it came from. We were just one of four homes in a very tiny little neighborhood. And two of us lost our houses, and two of us houses were untouched. There's quite a few of us, I think, that have lost our houses. I have to be applying for colleges during this time. UC Davis, UCSC, UC San Diego. I had this picture of a bear in a, it was just a card that I had framed. And I had like written myself a note of like encouragements. That's something I would have liked to have kept, but. What we got, our animals, and the few things that I grabbed are really what was like most important to me. All that stuff that I lost, it's kind of like gone to me in a way. Like that bunny, it's like, it's cool that I found it and it's like, it's like a cute little survivor, but I don't know that I necessarily like need to find more stuff. My recipe box. Scone recipe. Caramel corn recipe. Grandma's caramel corn mm -hmm. recipe. That was a good one. Better than the boardwalk and that's, <laughs> that's what she gave out on Halloween every year. And you'd get a Ziploc bag full of homemade caramel corn and that was... We had something called Angel Biscuits. The box has been there as long as I can remember. Yeah, I was gonna say probably 45 years maybe. Well, you never think to take your recipe box when you're evacuating. Ann McKenzie in Santa Cruz since 1955. Will Roberts. Born and raised up there. Born 1990 in the house until it burned down. I was four years old when we moved to Santa Cruz. It was the winter of the flood of 1955. Then we've made it through the flood of 82. I was pregnant with Will during the earthquake and we lived in Bonnie Dune. Um, this, this thing, that was my mother's sewing machine. You know, the old ones, the treadle machines, and, and but it had the little drawers and it was upstairs in Will's room. It didn't go straight down. A lot of it went on an angle. Boy, when I got to the sewing machines, that's the last room I went into. Because that was such a part of my life. I was doing wedding gown alterations. Well, I had three industrial machines, and then I had a couple other specialty machines. Um, and my work table, and my rack of patterns, and you know the history that I've collected of patterns over the years. And, oh my and these were some little books in here. But yeah, if you touch it, it's just ash. I'm gonna melt it all over everything. Like the window frames, um, the motorcycles. Have you seen those motorcycle pictures? We saw pictures online of our motorcycles. <laughs> they were like, wait, I know those. Those are our motorcycles. <laughs> so my work table is up in an open space. I'm just really trying to think, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to replenish all of those supplies? We do want to be back in Bonnie Dune. We want to rebuild. It's just going to be a process. So this was my grandma's roasting pan from, I think, the 50s. These are his, my grandpa's speed skates. This is my travel mug. So this is a, you know, daily companion. My name is Luke Bailey. I'm a park interpreter for Santa Clara County Parks. My house was at, in Boulder Creek, um, in the Memory Lane neighborhood. I brought several of the symbols that I evacuated with, the reminders of my values and what my dreams were 
before the fire. I put soil in a jar. Um, soil and madrone leaves and redwood leaves and yeah, pre-burned dirt. The soil's changed. I, I learned from the Resource Conservation District that when the soil burns, it changes. The forest at home this is the last thing that I'm worried about. I know that the forest is going to be okay. I recognize that our landscapes evolved with wildfire. Mother Nature is resetting herself. That's what fire is. She is resetting herself. By its nature, it is a restorative process. Hey, everybody. My name is Luke. To me, I'm a park interpreter if I rebuild, I, I am left with the question of, is it responsible for me to rebuild in the wildland urban interface? There's never going to be guarantees. And that's what stops me. It's like, this is a low point in my life, man. This is trauma. Why would I do that again? And at the same time, you know, mountain communities throughout the West are facing this dilemma. If there's any area in the country that rallies behind landscapes, it's the San Francisco Monterey Bay areas. If I could treat a rebuild as a project that could model how we can live in forests more wisely, I can tap into that hope because this place means so much to me. So I'm just holding all of it. My name is Tamar Ingber. I work at Pie Ranch, the farm stand. I lived on Swanton Road. There was the old dairy houses, and that was the neighborhood I lived in. The house is totally burned to ashes. Um, we didn't do any sifting of the property, um, but some pottery and metal pieces kind of floated to the top. This is my bowl. It is perfectly wabi-sabi, <laughs> and it's the only bowl that I successfully made in my pottery glass. <laughs> so it was my favorite one to put olives in or have a tiny little bowl to eat. The fire has given it like a patina, a little bit of blushing pink, and all of these hairline cracks. So when I found a bowl that I made, um, it felt important to pick that up and honor that. My name is Kurt Christensen. I've been an organic landscaper and farmer since 1979. Our home was in Bonnie Dune. We've lived there 18 years, raised our two boys there. We had beautiful gardens, a beautiful redwood grove. We've been lucky for being unlucky. We got the evacuation call 5.30 in the morning on Wednesday. As we were walking you know, through the house, I was looking around and there was this toy. It was our oldest son's first toy. And I had my hand on it and I said, you know what, we're going to be back. Everything's going to be okay. And I left it there. The next day, our neighbor who had stayed to fight the fire texted us and said, I'm so sorry, your home is gone. He included a picture and we could see the last of our home burning in the dark in the night. I'm almost glad that we just lost everything and it was so final instead of being the one home that was left. This is an angel that was on top of 
our Christmas tree when I was a kid. I don't know if it's going to fit on the top of the tree again, but we're going to try. I found the Abelskiever pan. I'm half Danish every Christmas. My mom would make Danish pancakes. They come out as little round pancake balls, light and fluffy. I had this beautiful blue Miata sports car with a tan top. I called it my little water dragon. And it was so burnt, like the whole car, it was like just totally burnt. And you could see these long trails of, of aluminum wheels that melted. And they both looked like Chinese calligraphy of a dragon. The Chinese character for crisis is the same as the Chinese character for opportunity. That's what we're trying to, trying to do. We were forced into it, but we're going to buy the crappiest house in the best location and build something new and wonderful and create a new chapter. We were looking for my mom's wedding ring, which we didn't find, but we did find this was my mom's. My name is Lily Karina. I was born in Last Chance, so my daughter would be second generation Last Chancer. My house and also my father's house and the houses of our two neighbors were all there. You know, out of 70 or 80 families maybe, there's only a handful of houses by the front of the road that survived. I mean, everyone had to run for their lives to get out of there. Uh, one neighbor spent the night in his pond, and then eventually it was uh, just one person who did end up passing away up in Last Chance, Tad. He was a unique local character. I mean, losing your, your possessions is obviously a huge thing to process, but this other aspect of loss, like, the loss of the community, the, the forest looking so devastated, and then this kind of frustration that, you know, why couldn't we have had more of a warning to get out of there? Um, you know, it, it's hard, I think, for any community that has to get left behind in one of these really catastrophic wildfires to reckon with, well, why wasn't Cal Fire there? Or why didn't the sheriff come and evacuate my friends and tell them they needed to leave? You know, those are like, as much as your logical mind understands that things were frantically happening in the middle of a disaster, your, your emotional body is just really affected by that failure of what you think of as your safety net. When we did the sifting, we had the nonprofit organization Samaritan's Purse come and help us just to know that you had tried looking for things before they come with bulldozers and scrape the house sites and take everything away. I just thought, if I don't at least look, then I'm always gonna wonder what might have been there. My name is Carrie Napolis. I'm a school board member at Pacific School Elementary in Davenport, and I'm the Senior Director of Development for the Humanities Division at UC Santa Cruz. We lost our home up on Swanton Road. When you're going through the ashes, you remember where things were in the house, and you can orient yourself to the footprint. Okay, this is where the front door was. They were over our front door. It took a little bit of time, but he found them there. They're called Shisa dogs from Okinawa, Japan. These are very common statues that you see all over Okinawa, over front doors and gateways. The male has the open mouth and the female has the closed mouth. There are a lot of different descriptions uh, for the meaning of those. One of them is that he opens his mouth with the first sound of the alphabet. Ah, the first sound. And the female with the closed mouth is saying, mm, the last sound in the alphabet. So that between them, 
All Things Can Be Said, which is the one I love so much. We evacuated on Tuesday the 18th and on Thursday the 20th. Our neighbor called us to tell us that our house had burned. I'm Mary Beth Curley. I lived on Everest Drive in Boulder Creek. Different things here. This is this object. It's a glass bead that um, doesn't even look like it's been touched by the fire. It's always been a, like a little tchotchke that we've had in the, the window and now it's really important because it's it's something that survived unscathed from the fire. This is this Bedouin wedding band. Tony bought it when he was in Israel in 1988. It was the first piece of jewelry he gave me. When Tony found it in the ashes, it was really important, you know? It's, it's, it is amazing what remains. My son was very curious. He just wanted to find a buck knife that his father had given him for his 10th birthday. That's the only thing Jackson wanted to find in the house. So he found the buck knife. The handle was burnt off, but the knife was still there. I have a daughter who's 13, Marlena. She um, did not want to go back and see the house. She hasn't wanted to see any of the pictures. Um, the thing that she was most upset about is all her books. She had a lot of books that she loved that burned. She loves rocks, and last time I went, I, I salvaged a lot of rocks for her, and I brought them back, and I was like, see, look, I brought your rocks. She picked a few, she put in her room, and then just the other night, she came out the back and, and put them out in the yard, and she said, they don't spark joy, Mom. We were digging and poking out of the ashes was this purple flower, was the first one I saw. And then I dug some more and we kept finding them and kept finding them and kept finding them. And we have about 16, 16 or 17 piggy banks. Every year we would go to petroglyphs downtown, my dad and I, and paint a piggy bank for my sister for her birthday. There's the penguin with the bolo tie. Um, this was the last one, this monster, for her 18th birthday. The entire history of the kids growing up in this house is spanned by this collection of piggy banks that we found. My name's Kaylee Chase, and I've just come back to help my folks. The second that they started talking about digging through rubble by themselves, I knew I needed to come and be there to be part of it. My name is Alan Chase. We lived in Bonnie Dune, and our house burned down uh, on August 20th, my birthday. I'm Linda Brackenberry. Alan's my husband. Kaylee's my daughter. The first day, this menorah was just sticking out of the ashes. I could see it. This one was the first one I bought after we were married. And this one belonged to my mother-in-law. I remember this from when I was a kid. You can tell by the design, it's from the 50s. It's the one we used for Hanukkah every year. Mom, did, was this one from the year I was born? That's from the year you were born. So this one's been around my whole life. I love this one. It's very much my mom's aesthetic in terms of art and joy. and It's a little bent, but it's pretty much, I think we can probably use it again. Yeah, I love this upside down person here. The three that are intact were the ones that were significant to the three of us, really. It's really not the most important Jewish holiday, but it's the one that we now have all of the objects for. I brought my flute, and these two things are bombillas. 
bombillas, which are the things you use in Uruguay to drink mate. And this one was mine, and this one was Rolo's, my grandson's. My name is Jennifer Cordery. I lived on Swanton Road. I'm from Uruguay. I've been in Santa Cruz for over 40 years. The house was in the woods, you know, with a creek nearby. It had a lot of great windows and light, which I'm a painter. All my paintings, all my drawings, all my art supplies, they all burnt down. You know, we've been back a few times with Rolo, my grandson. He, he wanted, he was excited to be a little archaeologist and found things. Um, it, it's an old truck of mine that we found at, in Swanton at Tata's broken down house. It's probably a water truck. You know, this is one of my grandson's trucks, which survived in a way. Um, That's pretty good. Can you hold it up even higher or no? I can, I can show you. It's been hard for him. For him, he's five and a half, almost six. My daughter would bring him in the morning and he would stay till the cows came home. <laughs> so for him, it was a place of freedom, of, of playing. We had the creek and we had all his trucks and Legos and books and toys that all burnt. I just told him, I mean, he was, I just said, you know, Swanton is burnt. The first thing he said to me, you know, something that can't burn, he said, it's the stories you told me. He says, and that can never burn. Swanton was a place, but the connection is with me, so the place is me too. This is called Trickster or Coyote Woman. From one side, it looks like a coyote howling at the moon with some feathers. As you turn it, you find that the coyote is a cloak skin around the body of an old woman, a shamaness. My name is Linnea Dunn. I've been a resident of Bonnie Dune since 1996. I started up there as a software engineer and then retired. Some of the artifacts may, you know, indicate that. I'm a witch. I've been a Wiccan priestess for 40 years. My degree's in physics, and physics is magic. Software's magic. <laughs> you know, trying to figure out what's underneath the surfaces of everything we see. It's part of exploring nature spiritual, physical, and making magic happen. The last project I did before I retired was I was working on Google Maps, which everybody uses every day. So part of my spiritual path is connecting with the earth. That's why I lived up there, and that's why I'm going back. I'm 69 years old, I've been acquiring interesting, wonderful things, art, paintings. They have to just basically scrape the whole house into trucks and haul it off to a landfill. These pots made it. This one, I kept small bits of the ashes of dear friends that have passed in vessels about four like this. There's Roz, and there was Allison, and there was Lee. When I dug these things out, I spread them out in the trees so they didn't get cleared away. And so now when I go back, that land has the ashes of my ancestors. Part of that land really needed a fire. It didn't need one like that, but fire's part of that ecology. Fire is part of that land, and we need to learn to live with it.
Denise Mozaleski and live up in Bonnie Dune. We built our dream house up there 40 years ago. I'm Dennis Mozaleski. I dug the foundation by hand and worked on the framing crews. Denise put on most of the roof. I was a highway patrolman uh, for a little over 30 years. Our oldest daughter, Cresta, was adamant. She had a passion to find my badge that was in the fire. What she wanted, that was... She said, Dad, is there something? She said, well, if we can find my badge. She went up and she spent about three hours going through the ash and couldn't find it. She went up the next day and she spent six hours looking for this badge. She's not a very uh, religious person, but she said she was just thinking to herself and praying, if there's really a God, you'll help me. She stood up. The badge was at her feet. Okay, well, this is the, what's left of the badge and there's also she found a a belt buckle in honor uh, of highway. That goes in the middle. But, you know, I wore it for 30 years. I think all the gold is melted off. <laughs> for me, I have to focus on the future. Had to have a project here, and that was to start thinking or about rebuilding. You know, you, I think you have to have a good attitude. My name is Felicia Rice. I'm the proprietor of Moving Parts Press, a letterpress uh, fine art and literary publishing effort. I founded in Santa Cruz in 1977. I lost my shop and all my work that was stored there in the fire August 20th. 46 years worth of collecting old style letterpress printing tools. Beautiful collection of type I inherited from Sherwood Grover, very, very fine printer. I inherited his legacy, and um, all of it was lost. It threw me entirely off balance. You know, without a press, I'm incomplete. It's a whole life of this kind of work. So we had to leave Santa Cruz. We were only renting for 25 years the same house. It's destroyed. We can't go back. I let it go in September. I just let it go. I said goodbye. And it's harder to say I'll bring a little of this or a little of that. I'll save something. You know, I brought ashes back the first time, rolling over and over in my mind what I lost and what I want to keep if I find it. And just is, is enervating. It's just draining. It doesn't give me any energy at all. And I need a lot of energy to uh, rebuild. So going forward meant going to the family home in Mendocino. I identified a very small shed that was my dad's studio, 9 by 14 feet. And it's been shaping up, and I was able to buy a press from a wonderful calligrapher in the area. The first thing I'm doing is printing three broadsides to support fire recovery in collaboration with Bookshop Santa Cruz. I just finished printing the first one which is a poem by Gary Young with a woodcut that he did in 1986. And then I'm doing a poem by Ellen Bass, The Thing Is. Another poem by Danusha Lamaris, Bookshop Santa Cruz. They'll be selling the broadsides to benefit fire recovery funding in Santa Cruz County. I, I will go forward as Moving Parts Press building a new studio with the help of many, many people who donated to a GoFundMe campaign. And I was shocked by the response that was so powerful from people. I felt like, wow, there is a community of people out there that have been listening and care. First came to Santa Cruz in 1990 after the Grateful Dead New Year's Eve shows at the Oakland Coliseum. <laughs> so I was part of that traveling gypsy circus of deadheads that toured around with the Grateful Dead and had the times of our lives and fell in love with it. 
My name's James Bear, and I'm a resident of Bonny Dune, California. I do carpentry and remodeling for work. Around three o'clock in the morning, something woke me up just like not right. The treetops were going <laughs> like, you know, like a freight train. It was happening so quick, there was no evacuation. There was no coordination through CAL FIRE for the first two nights. It was just chaos. I didn't want to go into the mentality of taking everything because I also didn't want to like visualize or manifest the fire happening. The crucial thing is I have a vintage Carmen Ghia convertible which I restored 12 years ago. So save that. And the last thing I did is actually I went out to my garden. I just sat for a little while, picked a few cucumbers and just you know touched the earth. And I was like, I hope, I hope it works out. Sometime that night, the fire double-backed and just took the, that part of our neighborhood. A long time ago, I got myself into a situation where I had to do some community service for the county, and that entailed uh, working for Caltrans, picking up trash along the side of the road. And I found this Buddha statue just in the weeds. I found that buried in the ashes, and I don't know how it did it, but bridge of the nose and across the eyes, the head just melted and slipped off to the right side. I found that and I just started laughing. It's just like, well, that's, that's what enlightenment is. You know, you just, you get it and your head just blows open. That just brought everything of my 30 years of meditation and yoga practice into fully comprehending impermanence and how beautiful it is because that's the only thing that exists impermanence. Then the Carmen Ghia, I still drive it up to Bonny Dune on the weekends. 13 mile drive through winding, twisty mountain road with no traffic or, you know, just turn on the Grateful Dead and let the wind blow on my hair and just, it's joy.